Let's go back to something like, and we can use St. Clair Shores or Plymouth Canton, um, whatever example, but what, what does it make a difference? Let's say you go into the, the school system. I don't know in what case um, who drove the connection to Michigan Roundtable, but obviously it wouldn't work, let's say, if parents didn't buy in. And it wouldn't work if students didn't buy in. I mean, it really would take all the parties to buy into wanting to take, you know, a project from A to B. Um, how has that been? I mean, have you seen that there's a resistance by certain people? I mean, what do you do when there's a parent that says, I'm happy with the way the community is? Um, why do we have to worry about this? How do you get all parties to kind of understand the importance of people getting along and, and dealing with um, diversity in the school system? Well, I think what we try to do is, you know, facts, facts are a powerful uh, uh, piece of data to put out there. So when we go into communities, um, you know, we've used Kurt Metzger, and Kurt does a great job with demographics, and he puts that up there. And I can remember that night we were in Plymouth, Canton. I think people didn't really realize the breadth and depth of what their community looked like. Then the second piece is before we, we, we start the ball rolling, we um, have a number of focus groups. So we've had youth, we've had um, uh, clergy, we've had, um, you know, the older population of, a, of an area, we've had black, white, we've had different races, we've had different religions. And again, we put some of those results out there. So the person that says, oh, my community's fine, if they pay attention to the facts, then maybe they see something different. And, um, you, know, you know, I know we were sort of in this age, or we think we're in this age, I should say, that because we have an African American in the White House, we're post-racial. I don't know what that term means, post-racial. Um, we need to be post-racism. We need to, with a small d, uh, democratize uh, the agenda here. But um, people ought to understand that some of these issues still exist. I mean, we had, in one particular community, uh, one of my staff, African American, was stopped by the police and was asked, what are you doing out here? Now, here, this is 2009 this happened as if the person doesn't have a right to be there. And when, when law enforcement's questioned, uh, they tell me, well, you know, we're just trying to make the, uh, the, the person we stopped at ease with a conversation to which I said, well, then why not just say, Hel you know, good evening, how are you? <laughs> so do you, understand, do you understand the history of that question, what that means to a person that's not white? And that's what we need to do. We need to put ourselves in the shoes of the other, and we fail to we we fail to do that. So, following through on that, then what happened when you asked the question? Do you realize the history of what you you know what's behind that? That's a loaded question. Was there a recognition or a realization? Uh, if there was, it wasn't immediate. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, when I think in some respects, um, you know, particularly in law enforcement, we've gone backwards on that. Um, issue of race and race relations. I mean, if you think in the 1960s, um, two-thirds of the population in prisons, uh, the population was white, and now it's completely reversed. And, you know, as uh, the noted anti-racist Tim Wise would say, well, what, what happened in the 1960s? It, white people wake up and say, oh, you know what? We're going to let our black and brown brothers do all the crime. We're getting out of it. And I don't think that's the case, obviously. I think our policing and our law enforcement, our criminal justice system has changed. And, you know, we have populations in prisons of 70, 80 percent um, African American, and, and African Americans only make up about 15 percent of the total population. So, again, like I said before, facts are powerful. There's something wrong with that. So, now going back um, on that note, going back to Michigan Roundtable and the work that you do, um, we talked about this with Frida as well. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts on it. When it comes to equity, or when it comes to, let's just even say, um, early childhood education we were talking about earlier this morning, getting people to understand and be moved by the fact that even if they're not morally or emotionally moved, can they be economically moved when you look at it's, it's better for our region, it's better for the nation, it's better for a community if somebody receives a quality education um, and can have the same job prospects, can be, you know, can have access like other people have access, it's, it's more a even economically advantageous than to not have equality in terms of the access to services such as education because you'll pay more for somebody to go through 
to be incarcerated. You'll, you know, it affects your bottom line whether you want to admit it that morally it doesn't affect you or not. So how, what kind of work does the Michigan Roundtable do in terms of those issues to help people understand why equity is better for everybody and it's not really just about if, if things are equal for us, it takes something away from me? Well, I think in our work, particularly um, partnering with Professor John Powell of the Kerwin Institute Ohio State, you know, we try to demonstrate to people that, um, that just because someone else, some other group has given something doesn't mean that it's taken away from you that we, it, it's a regional approach, and if you read any of Powell's material, he's all about regionalism. Um, and, and what we try to do, again, to quote Powell, is to, we try to make the uh, invisible visible, so people understand this. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm sometimes amazed at the lack of uh, understanding from folks outside the city um, that they don't agree with or don't get it, that if the city you know, crumbles, implodes, whatever, that the rest of the region will, and it, and it will. Um, and uh, I think we're seeing some of that now. It's just not the auto companies. So um, to not have a vested interest in the education of, of African-American kids in the city um, is, is very, very narrow-minded and short-sighted because those kids someday are going to apply for jobs at companies around here. And if they aren't equipped or prepared to take on that responsibility, we all suffer.